Detectives say the 32-year-old cold case was cracked with the help from a deck of cards. On each card, a different cold case, whether it be a wanted person, a missing person, or an unsolved murder. Well, investigators say a prison inmate saw the victim's face on one of the cold case playing cards and then tipped investigators off. The Bernalillo County Sheriff's Department had the cards made up at the suggestion of a former cold case detective. I'm Tommy Ray. Cold case card program I started here in Polk County has since grown across the U.S. This is not your ordinary deck of playing cards. These cards contain 52 unsolved cases, and with every hand that's played, the stakes are unusually high. They've been dealt to inmates across the nation, and investigators are hoping their tips will stack the odds in favor of the house. Now it's your turn. These victims have been dealt an unfair hand, and it's up to you to deal justice. Somebody, somewhere, has information that could be investigators' ace in the hole. Welcome to Season 1, Episode 4 of Dealing Justice. I'm Jennifer Dubasak. And I'm Lori Jennings. And today we're exploring the Garth Rector case. He's a 48-year-old assistant wrestling coach from Muncie, Indiana. The murder of Garth happened in 2008, but the wound is still so fresh for this family. I had the opportunity to interview his sister directly, and her love for her brother is so evident. As a matter of fact, Angie is the one responsible for getting Garth on the cold case playing cards. We interviewed the detective on the case, and he explains. My name is Kurt Waltower, and I was corporal detective at the time. I was the original investigator of the incident. I was actually contacted by his sister, Angie, and she brought the cold case playing card up to our attention. I think it's a great idea, and that's one of the reasons I called them. One of our persons of interest at that point was in and out of prison a lot, and I just thought it'd be helpful to have those cards in prison in case he had talked to somebody in prison, mentioned something about it, that somebody might want to reach out to us and help the case. And I know his parents aren't in good shape, and I would love to solve this before, you know, they pass, per se. We are so happy to have Detective Kurt and, of course, Garth's sister, Angie, and his entire family to be advocates for him. We always appreciate when families will open up to us and let us learn more about their loved one. And that's why we're so happy to be involved with this. And we always appreciate Detective Tommy Ray, who started the cold case playing card. And we just can't wait to see these continue to go on and on. And hopefully we can make a difference. As always, our goal is to lay out the timeline and pertinent details that may jog someone's memory. And obviously, we would love to see the day where there are no faces to put on the cold case playing cards. But until that day comes, we will continue working with Tommy Ray and telling these stories in pursuit of dealing justice. It's time for us to solve these cases one card at a time. Help us deal justice for Garth Rector. This is episode four, the Garth Rector case, Queen of Spades, Indiana deck. This episode of Dealing Justice brings us to Muncie, Indiana, an all-American clean-cut city, recently named one of Indiana's best cities to live in. But as you're about to hear, even the cleanest cities have a dirty side. 48-year-old Garth Rector lived in Muncie, Indiana, where he was a beloved son, father, brother, husband, and high school assistant wrestling coach at Muncie Central High. And he looked the part. His picture shows a handsome, tall, athletic guy who liked to wear his sports team shirts, his hat backwards, and his smile wide. In one picture, Garth is smiling at the camera, wearing an Under Armour shirt and holding a big taco. Yeah, he was that guy. Here is friend and fellow coach, A.J. Bradley. My name is A.J. Bradley, and I'm the uh, current head wrestling coach at Muncie Central High School. I know Garth uh, through wrestling, actually, because uh, he was a big figure here in Muncie. Uh, wrestling in Muncie is actually a very popular sport. It's a hotbed. And uh, Garth was well known here by people who went to Central and people like myself who went to the rival high school, Southside. I wrestled for South back when Garth did some of his coaching at Central. From an athletic standpoint at the time, 
he was somebody I couldn't stand because, you know, he was trying to get guys who would beat us and train them. Then as I got into the coaching world and, like, saw some of the stuff he did and heard some of his stories, that's when I got real, you know, enamored and in all of him because when you're a competitor, you don't always see the coaching side. When you start to go to the coaching side, that's when you start to see some of the things. And the South side was more of the wrestling school, and Central was more of the basketball school. And then all of a sudden, we're starting to hear of, of you know, these wrestlers coming out of Central or, or these wrestlers at the middle school that fed into Central were really good, and Central was starting to was like, what's going on? Like, you know, we're supposed to be the wrestling school. And then you get this name of Garth Lecter. And you find out that he's doing stuff at all levels. He's running the little kids in kindergarten, first grade. He's helping at the middle school with those sixth, seventh, eighth graders. He's also doing stuff at the high school. So it was the first time, you know, when I look back on it, that I'd ever seen a coach have a system in place for all ages. I think Garth was a guy, he did everything. Uh, he recruited the kids. He helped coach the kids. He painted the wrestling room. He did the fundraisers. He, you know, he was basically a, a one man. Crew, he had help and support, but, like, no job was too big for Garth or no job was too small. Like, he would mop the mat, you know. He did it all. He was kind of the enemy. It was frustrating, you know, because here's this guy taking this side of town that's not known for something, and then he's making it really good. He ended up pushing everybody, even us at the other schools, because, you know, we, we couldn't lose Central. <laughs> and so Garth had this ripple effect in the entire community. He just wanted to push the sport because he loved the sport and he loved working with kids. Garth was passionate about the sport of wrestling from a young age and was known for his athletic skills throughout his high school years and in his adult years. Garth grew into a trusted and respected coach, but at the heart of his passion were the kids. He loved to mentor and challenge the young minds that walked through those gym doors. He had a huge heart. And I got a chance to talk with Angie, his youngest sister. And Angie tells us he had an even bigger personality. Our house was always the house that everybody hung out at. On the weekends, people would come over to hang out. And inevitably, before the night was over, we would move the kitchen table out of the kitchen. And we'd have a big open area. And we'd all put on the 50s, 60s music. And everybody would just dance. Everybody, Garth's friends, my sister's friends, my friends, my parents, my grandparents who lived up the road, we would all be in the kitchen just dancing our little hearts away. After we get done dancing, Garth and his friends would have to start flexing their muscles. <laughs> no doubt. Now, granted, back then they didn't have a whole lot of them. One time, got it on video somewhere, Garth got up on the kitchen table and started flexing and acting like he was on a stage. And I'm telling you, Lori, he had my mom laughing so hard she about fell out of the chair. That was just him. Garth stood out in so many ways in the Rector family. He was the second oldest of four children and the only boy. Garth <laughs> was my mom's favorite, no question, hands down. And we all knew it. And we were okay with that. Now, I'll be honest. Mom never treated any of us less than she treated Garth. But when you have your only boy, he's special. Right, right. You know, you have three girls and one boy. Garth was going to be special. Garth would always, <laughs> he would always call mom and he'd say, hey, I'm bringing home 20 people for dinner. Is that okay? And then he'd bust out laughing because he'd be joking her. Um, you know, he would always play jokes or, you know, say funny things to mom to get her to laugh. And we always called him Buddy back then. His name was Buddy to everybody in the neighborhood, and they still call him Buddy. A brother whose nickname is Buddy, that says so much. But Garth wasn't just a funny jock who liked to entertain. He took his big brother title very seriously. When Garth was in high school and I was old enough to start dating, he, of course, had to approve anybody I would date. <laughs> he had uh, approved me going out with a young man that he wrestled with. And one of the guys in the locker room said, hey, I hear you're going out with Rector's sister. And he said, yeah, we're going out. And before he could finish talking, Garth had him up against the locker. And he said, you do not talk about my sister in the locker room. Good, bad, or anything else, do not talk about my sister in the locker room. And you know, we never, that boy and I never went out. But it scared him to death. And that's just how Garth was. He, he was just a protector. 
Garth graduated from high school and soon met his future wife, Angie Sue. Now, to avoid confusion, we will refer to his sister as Angie and his wife as Angie Sue. His sister, Angie, tells us about the early years of his family life. Angie Sue worked with my oldest sister, Kathy, at the bank. And somehow, Kathy just decided to introduce them. They started dating, and the rest is history. Um, I was in their wedding. And like, like I told you, Angie Sue and I are like, we're, we're like sisters. I mean, I don't even really consider her sister-in-law. Um, they... She had, they got married in Granville, Indiana, which is a little dinky spot on the map in our, one of our counties there in Muncie. And they got married in the center of pine trees, an opening in the center of pine trees on her parents' property. Wow. And uh, it was beautiful. They got married July 25th, 1981. And the colors were blue and white. And Garth wore an all-white tux with his black hair and black mustache. Oh my, he was handsome. Angie, Sue, and Garth fell into a typical adult life pattern. Garth got a job working in dining services for Ball State University in Muncie, and soon after, they had their daughter, April. Garth loved children, and while marriage took work, fatherhood came easy for him. When April was little, they worked it out, so he would work the day shift, Angie, Sue would work the night shift at the bank. And He would take her to the Cincinnati. They'd just pack up in the morning and go to a Cincinnati Reds game. Just Garth and April. They would go (laughs) hiking at a state park in southern Indiana. I mean, he took her everywhere. He coached all of April's softball teams. He even coached teams that April was not on, but in their community there in farmland, Indiana. He was always a mentor of some sort. Garth worked full-time for Ball State University but he never let go of his passion for wrestling. And when he got the opportunity to be an assistant coach for Muncie Central High, he jumped at the chance. And while life got busy for the family, as it often does, it took a toll on Garth and Angie Sue's marriage. In October of 2007, Garth and Angie separated. Garth started renting a house in Cowan, which is a little burg there off of Muncie, and was living out there by himself. There's no question Garth was well-loved and liked by all. But like the rest of us, he wasn't without his demons. Women love Garth, and Garth loved that attention. And that was a recipe for disaster. Oh, what a tangled web we weave. Garth, and I'm not going to lie, Garth had a lot of demons. If you have seen his picture, was a very good-looking man. Yeah, Garth had girlfriends, plural. However, his wife Angie Sue wasn't down with that. But divorce wasn't pursued by either of them. According to friends and family, Garth loved his wife and daughter. And although they were separated, he was taking the time to work on his marriage. But there was one major complication. That little house he rented in Cowan just so happened to belong to one of the women he was having an affair with. And she was engaged to another man. And she just so happened to live in a house on the same property. Garth had certainly spun a very tangled web for himself, and although he didn't know it, he was never going to get the chance to untangle it. March 2008. Although Garth and Angie Sue were separated, the bond Angie Sue had with Garth's family had never wavered. They loved their brother, but they stood by Angie Sue and continued to encourage the two to work things out for each other and for the sake of their daughter, April, whom he clearly loved so much. And in March of 2008, It appeared that reconciliation between Garth and Angie Sue may just happen after all. Garth's older sister, Marty, was retiring from a long and successful career with the United States Marines. It was a proud moment for the Rector family, and they planned a -a once-in-a-lifetime trip to attend her retirement ceremony in San Diego, California. The whole family was going to be together, and that alone was cause for celebration. But just as exciting was the fact that Garth seemed to be coming to a conclusion that he wanted his marriage back and this trip was an opportunity to make things right with Angie Sue. Here, Angie, his sister, tells us of her brother's intentions. Uh, his last words were, we're going to try to work this out. We're going to, you know, this is a good time to have the family together and see what happens. That's pretty much where we ended it. March 21st, 2008, Good Friday. Garth's sisters Angie and Kathy and Garth's estranged wife, Angie Sue, 
rent a 17-passenger van and head out on their trip to San Diego to celebrate Marty's retirement. It was a planes, trains, and automobiles kind of trip, but eventually everyone was going to meet up in San Diego on Saturday, March 22nd. Angie Sue, his wife and I, left Good Friday, March 21st of 2008, and we flew out to Las Vegas. We rented a 17-passenger van, and we drove to California to meet up with my sister in the Marines, at which time my parents and Garth and his daughter and her fiancé at the time uh, were going to leave that night. We were going to pick them up at the airport on the 22nd. Garth had to work at Ball State on March 21st, so he had made alternate plans to leave Muncie on Saturday, March 22nd and pick up his daughter April and her fiancé in Indianapolis, where they would meet the rest of the family in San Diego. But those plans would never come to fruition. On Friday, Garth went to work as usual, and on his way home, he made a couple of stops, one being a convenience store. He arrived to the house he was renting in Cowan, entered, and laid his grocery bag and drink on the counter, and turned around. Sometime between 7 and 8 p.m., Garth's landlord, who also happened to be the woman he was seeing, discovered his body. Garth was gone. A coroner's report indicated that Garth was shot five times, twice in the neck, once in the back and in the shoulder and in the right forearm. One of the bullets caused a cervical spine fracture. Others stuck in the victim's right lung and liver. The coroner reported that Garth likely died within seconds of being shot. Captain Kurt Waltauer explains. I was working the road actually doing extra patrol, which I usually didn't do, but as a detective. And I heard it came out, so I responded to the call. It came out as a shooting. What appeared through the evidence and the information we gathered was the victim, Garth Rector, was at work. Uh, He left work at his normal time. Uh, made a few stops on the way home. When he came home, it appeared that someone was in his house when he came home. And where they were located in the house, from the shell casings and things, they shot him and then exited through the same way they came in, more than likely. Someone down the road actually said they saw a car pulling out about the time this might have happened. Small silver car. That's all we have. To set the timeline for you, while Garth lies dead on his living room floor, his sisters and Angie Sue are arriving in good spirits to Marty's house in San Diego. Marty met them in the parking lot. We were almost to my sister's house in California when my sister called and said, hey, when you guys get here, don't, don't get your luggage out or anything. Um, just come straight up to the apartment. And I said, oh, what's going on? Because I'd been out there several times. She said, oh, there's some stuff going on in the complex, in the apartment complex, and, you know, just to be safe, just come on up. So when we got there, she met us downstairs, and we went up, and she then proceeded to (laughs) to say that, oh, gosh, I'm sorry. Gar's been shot, and he's dead. Angie Sue immediately started screaming and crying and praying. And I just kept staring at Marty. Because, you know, siblings play jokes on each other, you know? And I just kept waiting for her to bust out laughing and say, oh, I'm kidding. Not that that's a joke she would ever play, but when it's never happened to you, you don't know. It's unfathomable. I mean, you just, (laughs) it can't happen to you. Well, let me tell you, it happens to you. Meanwhile, back in Muncie, Garth's parents get the call no parent ever wants to get, no matter what age your child is. And his daughter, April, now 24 and living in Indianapolis, learns she's fatherless. Coroner uh, at the time knew Garth and uh, knew Angie Sue and her family. He called Angie Sue's dad, Garth's father-in-law, and told him. And then he had to call April. He had to uh, tell my parents, helpless, completely helpless. Back in San Diego, Angie and Angie Sue immediately book a flight back to Muncie 
to try and understand who on earth would want to kill Garth. There needs to be a playbook for families going Mm. through this. You don't know until you live it. People lose loved ones all the time, but by God, they don't lose them at the hands of someone else. The day that I got back from California on Saturday, I went out to the house that Garth was killed in. And the first thing a deputy told me outside of the yellow tape was, I just want to say to you, this is not a TV show and it's not going to be solved overnight. Of course, the landlady and mistress was the first person to consider, especially when they find out that she broke off her engagement and her ex-fiancé wasn't happy. Angie could not wrap her mind or heart around the fact that her beloved big brother was gone. She and the rest of the family had always refused to refer to the place he was living as his home, and now it was simply the crime scene. When her flight landed, she went straight over to see for herself. When I went into the the house he rented that Saturday and I saw the blood, Um, I think he went after them. I think, I think he saw them. I think, I think he looked them in the eye. I think he saw them shoot him the last time. Um, so I think I could be wrong. I could be wrong. It could have been someone, you know, getting revenge, but I, from what I, and I'm no police officer, don't get me wrong. Um, but from what I could see, it wasn't a one spot. I think Garth fought them. I think Garth went at them and that was the only way to stop him. Garth meant so much to so many people, but he meant everything to his family. Although they were grieving, they wanted answers. Can you imagine losing a loved one and then having to dive deep into their private life? knowing what you discover will hurt the people he loved most. Angie endured a lot of embarrassment by the stories of other women that came out. It's humiliating for her and then to have to go through his death and all these stories of a love triangle. And nobody has suffered more than Angie Sue, not knowing, were we going to get back together? Did he love me? Because it was ripped from her. The, the chance of knowing was ripped from her. Police soon learned that Garth's personal life was even more complicated than they thought. Garth, as it turns out, was also having an affair with a married co-worker from Ball State. Police found themselves with a growing list of suspects and motives. Was this a jealous ex-fiance or husband or girlfriend? Both men refused to fully cooperate with police. And police say there was no DNA evidence to go on and to further complicate an already complicated crime, police cannot rule out a burglary. There's two different avenues that were looked at. One was a one of the current ladies he was dating at the time, her ex fiance, that was a pretty jealous person. He's passed away since then, but we pretty much exhausted every avenue with him. And then the other avenue was a group of younger individuals that were doing home daytime burglaries at the time. There was no evidence collected at the scene that would help us like DNA or fingerprints at that time that weren't fingerprints of either Garth or of the girlfriend or somebody that was commonly in that house. I try to keep an open mind about it all because you never know. I mean, if I were to say that it's definitely a crime of passion because somebody wanted to, because somebody shot him five times, I mean, we could still have the random kid that was doing daytime burglaries got spooked. The guards was a pretty good guy in shape, wrestling coach, wrestled all the way through high school himself. You know, that kid could get scared, couldn't get it, find his way out of the house and had a gun in his hand. And I'm sure Garth was the type that would confront him. He wouldn't like run out the door and call the police. So be a younger person getting scared and just start shooting. But little sister Angie is not convinced about the burglary scenario. I just want to say Garth ran the Ball State basketball NCAA pool. There was at least $1,000 in cash in an envelope on the table next to Garth's keys, next to Garth's computer, and nothing was stolen. 
he had an Xbox because he's a boy and he played games. Mm -hmm. If they were truly criminals, don't you think they'd grab something? The community of Muncie was in shock. Everyone wanted to know who was responsible for this horrific crime. Unfortunately, they would have to wait. It's been 12 years and with no justice for Garth. Current head coach at Muncie High, A.J. Bradley, tells us how Garth's death has also affected the community. It's like a disbelief because our town, it's not like there's lots of murders. There's lots of things like that that happen. So when it happened, it's just like, what? Like, you didn't believe it. It's not the norm around here. Some places it is, but here it's like, what? And I remember I saw it in the paper right away. And, you know, and I saw it in the paper, and it was one of those where you read it, and you put the paper down, and you sit there for a couple minutes, and then you pick the paper back up and read it again just to make sure you read what you thought you read. Not only did this thing happen, but it happened to somebody you knew, and not just somebody you knew, but somebody who was in the same field as you, who you'd watched, you'd learned stuff from. You know, and he didn't know the the impact he had on me. He didn't know the impact he had on a lot of people. You know, so it was just one of those. It was just a weird thing. I mean, that that's the only way I can really describe it because he just couldn't grasp it and just kind of sat there for a while. It was a very trickle down effect of his passing, and it was really felt in wrestling on the on that central and that north side of town, because now that was gone. All his influence was gone. And I know that's secondary, but a lot of the stuff that he had built and he had helped grow and do was now kind of gone because there was no replacing a Garth Rector just like that. Like you couldn't snap your fingers and replace a Garth Rector. Garth Rector may have made his mistakes, but he inspired so many people with his passion Everyone makes bad choices at one time or another, but most of us will have the opportunity to right our wrongs. Garth Rector will never have that opportunity. You know, it's hard enough when someone is ripped away from you at another person's hands. When someone dies at the hands of another human being, it just pisses you off because they have no right. Who? What gives you the right to think that you have the right to take someone else's life? To think... If it was a husband who Garth had an affair with his wife, be mad at the wife, not Garth. Garth didn't owe them anything. She did. I don't know at this point that closure is ever going to change anything. They didn't hurt Garth. I've said this from the get-go. They didn't hurt Garth. Garth is not suffering. Garth is not going through anything that we're going through. Um my mom's stroke, um, April getting married and not having her dad to walk her down the aisle. Every little girl wants their dad to walk them down the aisle. We always say we're part of a group that no one wants to be in, but we're in it and we're in it together. I mean this with every fiber of my being. Even though I was in good place with Garth, I would give anything to have three minutes with him. To see his face, Garth had the best smile, the best smile. And the giggle that he had was just unbelievable. And that's one thing that's left in this hole that we have. If I could just have that for a minute, just one more minute. The most painful goodbyes are the ones that are never said and never explained. This case is so heartbreaking for the family and to have no answers for all of these years. I mean, someone's gotten away with murder since 2008. But let's go over what we do know in hopes that someone out there will come forward with new information. Exactly. Okay, so officially, officially, there are no named suspects in Garth's case. There are four persons of interest and then the burglary scenario. So let's go over them. The burglary scenario first. I don't know. I don't like this one. There's so many reasons why. I mean, you and I go back and forth about it, but I'm not down with the burglary uh, scenario. Oh, me neither. Uh, Absolutely not. And Gar's sister isn't either. I mean, for one thing, 
nothing was missing. Garth had cash in the house, his Xbox, all his personal belongings were still there. So nothing was missing. Yes, detectives received tips on the burglary scenario, and of course they're checking those out, but is it just a red herring in this case? Okay, but can I just say something? I mean, Garth, you know, seems like such a fun guy. Like everything that we've seen about him, he's always smiling. He seems like that guy he's fun to take anywhere. And I mean, I just, it really broke my heart to see, you know, in the grocery bag when he picked up groceries, you know, that he had Apple Jacks and he had a slushy and he has an Xbox. When his sister said this Xbox was still in the house, I thought, gosh. And then, like you said, put together with those elements, he was just a kid at heart. He really was. That's what breaks my heart about this is he just seemed like, you know, I know he was 48, but I think that um, he, you always see the child in people and that's heartbreaking. And, and you see that he was such a fun loving guy. He was going through a confusing state. I don't know. Was it a, a midlife crisis? Possibly. But either way, it's just sad that we'll never get a chance to see how he would have ended things. Right. And that's another reason why I don't buy the burglary scenario. I mean, look at the timing. It just so happened to be the day before he's ready to leave. Some people knew he was going to California to possibly reconcile with his wife and they didn't want that to happen. Right. And I think that you had some details also that his sister brought up that I think is very interesting. So the timeline is Garth goes to work that day. He comes home. We know that he may have stopped off somewhere else. Um, he did have a blood alcohol level of 0.11. So we know that he probably went and had a couple of beers somewhere, came home. Now tell them about the fact that he didn't park in his usual spot and why. He parked somewhere different because he was leaving first thing in the early morning hours and he came in a different entrance. And I find that very interesting. Had he come in the other way he normally would, he might have seen that there was forced entry. Okay, so he comes home and puts his groceries down and he turns around and he shot five times. Let's just start there. Garth had a girlfriend, mistress, whatever you want to call her. She owned a house that she rented to Garth during this separation with his wife. She had a fiance. And during this time with Garth, she broke off the relationship with the fiance. And to further add to this, that ex-fiance was familiar with the house. He had helped her with it. He helped her change out the windows. So he knew the layout of the house. He knew the whole thing. So I don't know, my, my money's on that. However, we won't ever get a chance to know. Tell us why, Lori. Well, because she has passed away and so has her ex-fiance. So both of those suspects, or I shouldn't say suspects, both of those people of interest. The police, I find it very interesting. The police don't call them suspects. They won't name names and they are called persons of interest. So the police specifically do not want to say suspects. They say people of interest. That's got to be so tough for the friends and family in the community who want, you know, answers and justice for this to think that two people that may know those answers have since passed. So hopefully if somebody is out there and knows something and anything about that, I mean, why not come forward? Why not at least give those answers to the family? Um, okay, and then who else do we have? We have the second female is the one that was her co-worker at Ball State University. And they worked together and they were having an affair um, as well. And she was married. And apparently people have said, too, that the husband had threatened Garth before in the past Again, these are unnamed people, so we have no way of verifying or talking with people because nobody's talking or naming names. Um, but again, if somebody knows of their relationship or knows of something they may have seen on the university campus or somewhere else, there are rumors out there that there's been some altercations with that. And again, if he was a jealous husband, he might have wanted to take care of Garth. And maybe the fact that he was going to California the next day was completely coincidence. Unless the woman kind of, you know, women can be conniving. If she knew Garth was going and kind of been like, oh, and kind of giving him the push to go do something. Or could this have been one of the women themselves? You know, I mean, it, it, think about it. Okay, so he's had these relationships and I think it's clear that, you know, it wasn't one. It wasn't this long-term relationship. He was kind of going through this phase, I suppose, where he had several girls going on. So now one of the women could have done it and, and, and in a rage because, you know, obviously everybody knew of the plan that he was, this was the trip that, you know, maybe they were going to be able to reconcile. 
And again, his entire family was all about that. They were never going to accept anyone else in his life other than Angie Sue. Let's talk about the landlady also. I mean, she's the one that called 911. And what do they sometimes say about the person that found the body? Exactly. So apparently she was at work. She came home. And see, this whole thing gets a little hinky right here. She comes home and she goes to check on him before he's leaving on his trip. And so she walks in the door. And again, she, you know, there's no evidence that she said, oh, I saw a forced entry. It just says she walked in and found him on the floor. And so she found his body and she called 911. Right. And she knew of his travel plans. That's supposedly why she went to check on him. But did you also know that after all this happened, she had a new tenant in that home within two weeks that Garth was killed there. Obviously moving forward as quickly as possible to just get another tenant in there. And perhaps did these two women find out about each other? So, you know, you know the guy that you're seeing has a wife, but do you, when you find out that he has a wife and another girlfriend, sometimes that amps up the emotions. So to break down the four people of interest, there's really two things going on here. There are two women who were not happy about Garth's reconciliation with his wife. And then there are two men who were probably not pleased with his involvement with their women. At the end of the day, I think all that matters is that if you have any answers that we just beg people to come forward, you know, again, you and I have talked about how many people do we know that have made mistakes and in this particular mistake? You know, so I I don't think it's fair that it define him or, you know, that he didn't get the chance to right the wrong. I think the thing that we heard from everybody is that Garth loved his wife and loved his daughter. And by the way, you know, his wife has been such a pillar of strength and such an amazing woman. I think she's been through a lot and she said what she said. And they all allow pretty much Angie, the younger baby sister, to be the warrior for the family. And, And Angie does a wonderful job at it. She sure does. And we so appreciate the work that she did on getting him on the the cold case playing cards. She's such an advocate and such a great example of what you need when the unfortunate event happens, such as a death or somebody goes missing. You really do have to have that strong bulldog mentality to get things done. And this family has rallied around Angie as the, the leader to speak for them. And they're very lucky to have each other. That's why it's so important. If you know something, please come forward to help the Rector family find justice for Garth's murder. Anyone with information on this case can call Captain Kurt Walthour at 765-747-7885, extension 404. Or you can also reach Detective Mitch Corey, same phone number at extension 444. Like us on Facebook at Cold Case Playing Cards for all the latest information on this case and other cards we'll be featuring on future episodes. Healing Justice is written, produced, and hosted by Jennifer Dubasak and myself, Lori Jennings. Our sound design is by John Schaub. Our executive consultant is the Cold Case Playing Cards creator, retired FDLE Special Agent Tommy Ray. If you want to help us spread the word about these victims' stories, please subscribe and leave us a positive review on your favorite podcast app. And tell your friends to subscribe. Thank you for being a part of this, and please join us next time on Dealing Justice. <laughs>